What happens when the best community house in the whole world is in a park? One of the big things that happens in the neighbourhood house is we have um, a kitchen and it's a really busy kitchen and it's at the, the heart of the centre really and we run a lot of our classes there. We teach language and literacy through cooking and it's a, we find it's a great equaliser and a great place for people to communicate with each other. And everyone's on an equal footing really in, in how they their relationships with Began food and to realise cooking. that um, we should take it the next step and grow the food that gets cooked. Then people from the neighbourhood approached us and noticed that we had this community garden so then they became involved. I like the community feel, I like the fact that we have a garden when we live in the city. A dream of mine is to move out to the country and have acres of garden, but for now this is my compromise. Yeah. Um, I love teaching my son, he's three, yeah. about growing his own food, knowing where food comes from, knowing how hard it is to grow one broccoli. Yeah. Um, you can't just go to the store, buy a broccoli and toss it out a week later because you've grown it, so you've got to eat it. Um, because you know it's taking you three months of hard work and hard work. To meet people, especially because I'm French and I like to meet to mix with Australian people and see the difference in gathering between the two countries and just sharing everything together. We got a bit more funding, the City West Water. What did they do for you? They put in our water tanks and everything grew fine while we were here teaching in the holiday, in the school terms, but outside that and in the summer holidays everything died and we couldn't be using Maine's water to water a garden because it was a drought year. We got some funding through the Bendigo Bank. We wanted kids to be able to walk through and talk with the gardeners and the local community to wander in and look at what's growing and ask people what they're growing and how they're doing it. In, while all of this was happening, we also got approached by another local group um, led by a, a woman who was on council at the time, Rose Isa, who wanted to develop this park from being a fairly bleak, weedy patch of grass with no shade to an enhanced community facility. We were active participants because we feel very attached, but it's not our park. We're, mm. we're located on the park, but we don't own the park and we wanted to keep that community ownership up. And through this survey, we, we found out lots of reasons why people care about this place and people feel very strongly about it. So we've kept a lot of open space, playground facilities for kids. We've put in a barbecue, well, I say we, it's been the council who's done that. Um, that because we already had the, the veggie patch here and, and a lot of people s see that as an important aspect of the park now, um, the woman who designed the park also incorporated um, an avenue of fruit trees to kind of merge between the children's playground into the veggie patch. So that How was the that next happen? thing that happened. Because we had the, um, the orchard, again, people began to notice that the trees were beginning to suffer because they were surrounded by grass and we really needed to protect the trees from being mowed up against. So they um, designed a food forest that's on permaculture principles um, that would involve a community blitz day where um, somebody designed this great plan for a food forest to grow under the trees which involved mulching around the trees and looking after the trees primarily and then expanding the idea of the kitchen garden out into the parkland 
with little pathways again so that kids can wander through, anyone can wander through and pick things as they ripen. So we had council involved. Um, they gave us, in, uh, got the mulch for us, they gave us the permission to um, move out into the parkland to do it. Yeah, Minty's been very involved. Um, the Melbourne Inner North Transition, Transition Group. Group. <laughs> Joanne and Dylan, who were permablitz designers, permaculture designers, did this great design and then they involved a per, engaged a permablitz, which is um, people who are interested in permaculture gather on one day and it, it can be about 40 people in one place on one day with a good bit of groundwork of organisation to get it happening. Everything's ordered in, everything's ready to go and those 40 people turn up on the day and they, they knock it over. So there's a design, there's a work plan, everybody learns from doing it. And, and the people who come here, they'll tell other people then we're approached by groups like My Smart Garden, which is run across various councils. Having having the um, having the park next to the neighbourhood centre makes it what? Oh, it's a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> the first thing you do whenever you come in here is open all the blinds and open all the curtains and look out. Mm. You're not stuck in an office somewhere. You're not um, relying solely on electric lights and air conditioners you can open the doors to the day that's outside. It doesn't sound very institutional. It's not and we hold dearly to the fact it's not institutional. Many people yes. haven't even been to formal schools in their countries and that's that's an awfully steep learning curve to go into institutional learning and if we can keep it informal and relevant to them, then they're going to learn a lot more. Sort of like crossing, crossing the divide. High quality is often real, relevant education in a real, relevant place.